We're going to talk about seismicity produced by hydraulic fracture stimulation and wastewater disposal. So some issues associated with unconventional oil and gas exploration and development uh, activities. So these are things that, um, you know, if you have un unconventionals in your backyards, you, you have issues associated with them. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Uh, there are a subdivision of a, a few topics. We're going to look at just developing a good feel for the background geology of your area. Uh, and we'll be using geophysics, of course, to do that. We'll talk about briefly about hydraulic fracture stimulation, HFS, what it is, and uh, the microseismicity that's generated during hydraulic fracture stimulation of your uh, wells. And that will also include this topic of the magnitude scale and uh, energy release, just to keep things in perspective. Then we'll talk about induced seismicity, and the induced seismicity that we talk about will be the seismicity associated primarily with wastewater disposal, but we'll also provide some examples of induced seismicity associated with hydraulic fracture stimulation. There are a relatively small number of cases of induced seismicity associated with hydraulic fracture stimulation, but we'll present uh, uh, a few of them just uh, uh, to provide perspective. So <clears throat> in the central Appalachians of uh, North America, we have the Marcel Shale. And this is a prolific uh, shale gas uh, reservoir. So uh, you can see that it um, thins over to the northwest, uh, exceeding 100 and up to 200 uh, or more feet in thickness over here, uh, going off to zero to the uh, west-northwest. And we're going to be looking at some examples that are probably characteristic of this kind of 100, uh, 100 to 120 foot thick region. This would be a typical stratigraphic uh, column for the for the region. And you can see we have a pretty much the entire section. The log doesn't show the Cambrian, uh, but there is a thick sequence of um, Cambrian sediments that go down to a metamorphic and igneous basement complex in the region. So you can see that the section is uh, fairly thick, thick just for scale. We've got the Marcellus here in the ba at the base of the Middle Devonian. And, uh, it lies at a depth, well, it, it depends on where you are in the uh, in the region, but, you know, in this area we're talking about uh, depths that are on the order of uh, 8,000 feet or so, 24, 70 meters subsurface. And if we just kind of expand this section here, we, our zone of interest is this uh, Marcellus Shale. It lies on top of the Onondaga limestone, the Huntersville Chert, and the uh, it's kind of sandwiched between a couple limestones, the Tully limestone at the top. And you can see here, this is a gamma ray log, so the gamma ray is quite hot down here in the lower Marcellus. And as we get up into the upper Marcellus, uh, the gamma ray begins to drop off. Not surprisingly, these are the most organic rich uh, intervals within the Marcellus. And uh, another point that I just mentioned to keep in mind is that the Marcellus in this area is sandwiched between two limestones, two fairly hard units, and they tend to serve as pretty good, pretty good frack barriers uh, for hydraulic fracture treatment of the Marcellus. Not too many events go down below the Onondaga, a few go up above the Tully. So in terms of knowing your geology, knowing the local area, uh, we've got an interesting contrast here. So uh, the Bradford is a reservoir that was has been drilled all over the past hundred years. 
and uh, the structure revealed by correlating well logs looks pretty much like what you see here in this 3D seismic uh, uh, a display of a surface that's uh, 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 correlated through the 3D seismic volume. In other words, there isn't really too much structure on the Bradford. And so if you were going to drill wells into the Marcellus, which would be down here, these reflection events that we see here, you would be assuming that there really wasn't very much in the way of significant structure that you were going to be encountering in this, uh, in this area. Uh, so you would be misled. That would be one of the benefits of having 3D seismic data. Uh, it can really reveal, well, you know, we have detachment down here, and that, those detached structures do not go up into the shallower uh, Devonian section. Uh, they come up out of the deeper uh, Salina salt, which is a detachment horizon in this area. Now, if we look at the <clears throat> lessons learned from 3D seismic, uh, we see in this particular area, and uh, this is a paper by Sullivan, uh, that the well pads are placed on over the over the over the faults, so we have laterals that are going out to the northwest uh, and to the southeast from pads that are located directly over the fault. This makes landing your wells uh, much uh, simpler. Uh, you can imagine that, that if you set your well pad up here and you were drilling in this direction, you'd run into a fault. Uh, surprise, surprise! That wouldn't work out too well for you. Uh, you can see over here in, in a uh, cross section that. As we're drilling our wells, uh, if you didn't know the structure, you'd be coming down and probably, you know, attempting a landing somewhere down here. Um, that would require, in order to get into the lower Marcellus uh, to the west, that, that would require uh, some rather um, vigorous uh, turning and steering of the well in order to get back into section. Most likely you would run out of section, run into the Onondaga. So uh, knowing something about the structure is critical to the placement of your well pads and also to uh, facilitate a kind of an easy landing of the and geosteering of your lateral into the uh, into the pay zone. So here's just another example of that structure. We have a thrust fault over here. Uh, these are laterals that have been drilled into the Marcellus. We have some observation well locations that are noted. We can see the orientation of SH Max here. Uh, generally, you also want to know where your faults are because in this particular case, SH Max is kind of clamping these faults together. It's at a fairly high angle. If it was oriented a little bit more to the uh, <clears throat> kind of the north, the northeast, it would be coming in here at a lower angle to the fault, and injection into the fault, for example, uh, accidental injection into the fault, could produce um, um, you know, these, this fault could be stri critically stressed in that case. Uh, but that, in the present example, SH Max is holding the fault together. We don't have a whole lot to worry about. This, on this reverse fault. But this is just kind of a close-up of um, <clears throat> one of the faults that we looked at over here. And uh, coming coming into another example here, we have, um, uh, we can see the layout of the wells that are drilled into the Marcellus. With, uh, we've got three horizontal wells uh, coming up onto the high side, the hanging wall of this thrust fault, and then we have three wells going off onto the uh, football. So we have these uh, thrust faults which are propagating uh, from the uh, uh, southwest to the northeast and uh, SH Max again in this area is holding these faults together but the 3D seismic, just, just to emphasize, the 3D seismic um, really does help you understand the subsurface geology, understand the configuration of the reservoir that you're going to be exploiting, and uh, helps you strategically place your um, uh, pads and uh, minimize difficulties in geosteering. So, so. 
Uh, this is just another uh, example from another area in the basin. These are two uh, lateral wells. In this particular case, 3D seismic wasn't available, so regional wells and uh, the penetrations encountered along the laterals were used to develop a structure contour map. Uh, this would be a structure contour on the Onondaga limestone, which just sits below the uh, Marcellus. It's, it's right at the base of the Marcellus. Over here we have the vertical pilot well, and you can see the uh, Marcellus uh, Onondaga interval here. This is this hotter zone. And the uh, landing, you can see from the gamma ray log that's uh, plotted up here, we're, we're in, this, uh, in and near this uh, hotter uh, gamma ray streak at the... Um, near the base of the Marcellus. So we also see the presence of a cross-strike structural discontinuity in this area based on the difference in contours between the two wells and the regional trend, which is uh, off to the uh, uh, northeast in this area. So we have something which is actually going, going almost orthogonal uh, to the regional uh, structural trend. And uh, these cross-strike structural discontinuities are common in the area, so it's not surprising that we see one. Uh, and it is interesting that we see wells on either side of it. Uh, but we could expect this zone to be a zone of increased fracture intensity, and we might see kind of a preferential fracking of the region between these two wells. Of course, you know, in the previous example here, we, in this example, we have one monitoring well. So we aren't going to be able to get fault plane solutions. Um, and there are, you know, there are different ways to monitor your microseismic, and that usually depends on, on how much money you have. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the more wells you have, if you have two wells, that's a lot better than one well. Uh, you can get uh, uh, fault plane solutions if you have this... Uh, uh, spoke-like uh, arrangement of uh, surface arrays, uh, then, then you get more of an aerial distribution of the um, uh, microseismic activity that's generated during hydraulic fracture treatment. You can get fault plane solutions. You can also get that with a surface geophone array, as well as a combination of surface geophone arrays and vertical, uh, vertical arrays. So, this depends really on how much money you have available and maybe as you're starting off and trying to learn something about the area and how it's going to behave, uh, the better approach is to put more money into your endeavor uh, so that you get a um, uh, more comprehensive um, uh, view of the microseismicity, its distribution, uh, the kinds of offsets that are being produced in the subsurface and their relationship to the orientation of principal stresses in the region. And that's going to increase your increase the confidence of uh, the general public in, in the operations that you're conducting. It's going to make it uh, a more acceptable uh, process. So uh, we're always interested in minimizing induced seismicity. So again, knowing where your faults are is important. But a lot of wastewater injection, wastewater disposal wells, are the injection uh, intervals are deeper in the sedimentary section, and they're actually closer to the deeper basement faults. So we have some faults here which extend down into the um, crystalline, uh, crystalline basement. And um, so if we were doing wastewater disposal in some of these intervals closer to the basement, one of the things we will want to keep in mind would be the orientations of these faults, their relationship to SHMAX, and um, try to avoid any potential for reactivating faults such as these because these are the kinds of faults that, and we'll talk about these later in Oklahoma, also in Ohio, uh, and uh, the Boland Shale over in the United uh, Kingdom, and so on. These are the kinds of faults that might be reactivated, that might produce seismicity on the order of magnitudes 3 and higher. Uh, just in... Um, 2016, there was a magnitude 5.8 earthquake in the Oklahoma area, and those are suspected to, to result from wastewater disposal and uh, increased pore pressure in the deeper crystalline basement rocks. 
So this is just a brief kind of introduction of um, the kinds of issues that you'll want to be thinking of, about, the kind of information that you'll want to get your hands on before you start to drill your wells. And um, we'll talk to you next time. We'll take a quick look at hydraulic fracture stimulation. So thanks for joining us, and we'll talk to you then.